Walk with me through the cellar door. A storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar Door Skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. Tonight we have a very special guest. We have a gentleman who is running for Governor of Mich- Michigan. We decided to have Todd on tonight because we thought, hey, why not talk to some of the people that are going to be running? Todd, Todd's website, how Todd's reached out to me in terms of his marketing it actually is something that we do. He used, I saw him through Facebook. It was something we were able to connect with. And I started to read through his message and say, hey, I think this is a change from the status quo, which is one of the big things that he talks about on his website. So I thought it would be a good idea as we need to gear up again from the issues we had over a year ago when somebody put the orange Cheeto monster in office and kind of talk with how can we change our local communities to more benefit the people that live in them. So without further ado, Please welcome Todd to the show. How are you doing tonight, Todd? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you, Chris. And I'm going to ask you to pronounce your last name. I did that on purpose. It's a kind of a gimmick on the show. I, I, if my co-host was here, he would challenge me and be like, you need to try and pronounce his name, but I am awful at last names. <laughs> <laughs> well, my last name is pronounced Schleiger. Schleiger. All right, there we go. <laughs> so good. So I, I would have completely butchered it. But luckily you said it on the show. And again, for everybody listening, we will have all the links to his Facebook and to his website. And we'll also talk to him a little bit about how you can help get involved if you want to help support Todd throughout his campaign. Todd, your your Facebook page actually came into view and I kind of saw it was either an ad or somebody had shared one of your Facebook page. And it talked about an independent candidate running for governor. Now, first off, I'm interested in anybody challenging a Republican, (laughs) just so you know ahead of time. Anybody that wants to challenge the Republican status quo, I'm 100% for. But I was very interested to go through your website and to kind of read through some of the different, you know, goals and objectives that you had. And I I saw one of the big things was you want to be held accountable while holding others accountable, and you don't want to play the game of the status quo. So tell everybody a little bit about your campaign, your movement, what has drawn you to run for governor of Michigan? Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, first off, uh, over the last 40 years, I've paid attention. I've always been an independent. I've never been a registered Democrat or a registered Republican. I've always believed that we need to think for ourselves and that we need to do our research and see who we're putting into office. Um, you know, I've voted Democrat. I've voted Republican before. So it, to me, it's a matter of doing what's right for my family and my community. You know, that's how I always look at it. Now, for me to run as an independent, I am sick and tired of the games both parties are playing. I mean, they if you pay attention to it over the last 40 years here in Michigan, whether we've had, I mean, we've had Angler, we've had Grand Home, we've had, well, we've got the idiot in there now, and I'm not going to apologize for calling Schneider an idiot, but... <laughs> the whole fact is, all they've done is raised our taxes. They they really haven't completed any promises that they've given to the people. Uh, I mean, you got Brian Kelly, our lieutenant governor, out there right now. I mean, he's he's toting how he's gotten rid of a lot of taxes, but he doesn't want to tell you that he's the tiebreaker that brought in the pension tax on our seniors and stuff like that. You know, we need real change in Michigan. And the only way we're going to get real change is to put somebody in there who's not part of the two-party system. And we need to break that system to the fact that people have a third option on there. Now, we've had the Green Party out there. We've had the Libertarians out there for numbers of years. But I think the real way to go is an actual 
non-party affiliated independent, somebody who can cross both party lines to get the job done for the people. So now in, in saying that, are you able, are you, how are you doing that? I guess how, that's the, the biggest question. You know, I mean, are you being accepted by Republicans and by Democrats? And I know we're a little early. I mean, I, I guess a year out is not really early to be honest with you, but it is kind of a little bit early compared to what a lot of, I don't see a lot of other campaigns out there right now. I think we've had one other gentleman on the show who is running for an office and that's it. Um, so, so how are you reaching across both sides of the aisle? Well, first off, you know, I, I agree that I, I can work with Democrats and Republicans. Let me give you a little history about what I have right now going on. All right. Like I, like you've said, and I've said, I'm an independent. My running mate is a Democrat. He is a registered Democrat. My campaign manager is a Republican. We have put together what I like to call a common sense coalition, something that hasn't been done in Michigan at all. And, uh, you know, with our signature drive right now, we're like 12,000 signatures shy of being on the ballot. Now, we get to make history by just getting on the ballot. There has never been an independent candidate on the ballot for gubernatorial. So we are going to break that barrier. Hopefully it'll be by the end of January. But after that, every month we're going to lose signatures. So we're going to have to keep going. We have until July 15th. but. And then I also look at it this way. If I can't get the independents to come on board or the Republicans to come on board, we'll circumvent the system and go directly to the people. Because after all, we are direct, we are working for the people. You know, and that's what I want to get across to the people. I'm going to be a candidate that's not going to be sitting in Lansing when I do win the gubernatorial. I'm going to be out traveling all over Michigan, talking to the people, finding out what needs to be done other than what I already know. I mean, we, you know, we are being our auto insurance is outrageous. Uh, our health insurance is getting out of control. You know, our ta- <coughs> excuse me, our taxes are out of control. And I, I mean, if you've read my website, you'll also see on there that I plan on eliminating the property tax on your primary residence. And a lot of people say, well, if you eliminate that, how do we fund our schools? How do we fund our police departments and fire departments? The key phrase that comes in front of that is a total restructuring of our tax system here in Michigan. We have so many taxes that just overlap each other. It's not even funny. And, you know, mom and pop businesses, they, you know, they've been the backbone of the United States and our state for over a century. So we need to help them out as well. And part of that tax restructuring, and I know I'm going in depth here, but the whole thing is like our uh, state corporate tax. Schneider raised that to 6%. The only problem is that's mom and pop businesses that are paying that full 6%. You've got, uh, and I and I do not knock the big two. I'm going to say the big two because Chrysler is now foreign owned. Yeah. Well, it has <laughs> so. Uh, you know, they pay just over 4%, you know, which is fine because they do hire. I had this brought up to me. They hire tens of thousands of people, but mom and pop hire nearly 10 times as many as the big three, if we, we want to still call them that. Okay. Mom and pop is paying the full 6%. The insurance industry, which is bleeding our families dry, whether it be health insurance and auto insurance, is only paying 1.75%. How is that fair to the people? You know, uh, they got high deductibles on health insurance. Half the time, you will never utilize your insurance unless you have a catastrophic claim. You know, so you're giving them free money every month because you don't utilize that. Well, we have a plan to lower health insurance here in Michigan by 50%. We have a plan to lower auto insurance between 47 and 70%. You know, these are all very viable things that the state could have been doing for decades. Yeah. When the insurance started to climb, <clears throat> excuse me, and the and they made these two insurances, auto and health, mandatory. The problem I have with that mandatory is the fact that they're not keeping it affordable. Now, when Obama brought the ACA or Obamacare, as it got has been known as, 
<clears throat> the good thing about it is he brought in pre-existing. So there was no way that people could be cut out of health insurance. They started the health insurance exchanges on the website. And then what they did is people don't see the amount of money it was costing the rest of the taxpayers in the United States. Instead of attacking it the proper way by attacking the health insurance industry and attacking the poor hospitals, as they like to be told, that they need more money. And I'll give you an example. Beaumont here in, in uh, my area over here in Oakland County said, you know, they need to, to make more money. They're not making it through their uh, annual I forgot the word I'm looking for, but the whole problem is they showed a profit of $4 billion. They're building a strip mall that has nothing to do with the hospital just to provide more income. And I'll give you a perfect example why I'm attacking them the way I am. Let's use our MRI for an instance. Okay. If you're on Medicaid, which is a state funded system, you're, they're paying just under $500 for an MRI. Medicare pays just under 700 for an MRI. Those of us who have a third-party insurance like Blue Cross Blue Shield, they're paying nearly $5,000. So this is why I'm going after to work things out for the people of Michigan because we have to make it we have to make it fair. I'm so, I'm not so I'm gonna, gonna I'm, not, I want to stop you for just a quick second cuz I kind of I want to go let's go back to the healthcare thing. You know, because okay. some some of me says when you say, hey, you're going to lower taxes, I get a little hesitant. You know, again, I'm a liberal. So, you know, that's part of, you know, some of my MO. I'm not against taxes. I'm just for better taxation. You froze up on me there. Do, so what, what I was saying is that, you know, when you were talking about taxes, I'm not as for getting rid of taxes, per se. I'm for redistributing the taxes to get better you know, to, to better al allocate the taxes to everybody else. Correct. But when you talk to me and you say, hey, I'm going to lower health care insurances, I'm going to stop some of these hospitals from having $4 billion profits and building strip malls. Hey, I'm on the same page. I'm just hoping you're not going to take taxes out of the system to, f to allow for them to continue to thrive. So, so I guess how are you going to, to attack that type of a situation? So, for example, when they when they do have that $4 billion profit and we're struggling as middle income, you know, taxpayers who are going through the ACA, how are you going to change what, what the insurance companies are doing and what the hospitals are making? All right. There's a, there's a key thing that's written into the law for the medical field, so to speak, the hospital and your big pharma. Okay. That key phrase that's put in there is they can charge a reasonable fee. That's all it states. We need to put something on there that uh, puts a cap on their so-called reasonable fees. It wasn't too long ago with that EpiPen incident where the EpiPen was normally $50 per pen, and then all of a sudden it, it went all the way up to $750 per pen because one manufacturer made it here in the United States, and that was where the insurance companies were buying it from. Okay. Yep. And the tax restructuring that I've talked about, here's an example for it. It's a state income tax. This benefits 80% of the people. Right now we have a current 4.25 state income tax. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you make a, uh, all the way up to $150,000, your tax will drop down to 2.5. If you make one hundred and fifty thousand in that proverbial penny, up to three hundred and fifty thousand. Your taxes is going to stay right there at four point two five. To offset the cut for the eighty percent of the people, if you make over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you're going to jump up to six percent. Okay? okay, and that's that, fair. I find that fair. That that's a redistribution of wealth appropriately. How about capital gains? How are we going to handle some of those uh, individuals hiding? <laughs> Taxes. Well, you have to watch where you're where you're coming in with the Fed because we don't want to bump heads with them too awful much, but we still want to set a game plan up so that other states take notice of what we're doing. Okay, I you know my my running mate he runs more towards the federal side of all this, and I let him run wild with the Fed. To me personally, I almost always tell them I don't care what the Fed's doing; I care what's going on in Michigan. That's where my goal is. 
everything that we have set up and all the plans between health, auto insurance, and tax restructuring is all based on 80% of the people in Michigan. Because 80, and I, you know, and I've been told that's a high number to try to hit. But to me, I feel if I don't place it up high enough, then I'm not challenging myself to get the numbers down for the majority of the people. And I mean, I would love to say 100%, but I can't make everybody happy. And I know that. But at, but at the same time, I want to bring, I mean, like when I started to tell you on the corporate tax in Michigan, I want to bring that down to 3% so that the majority of mom and pops get relief. Okay. The, the insurance industry, they'll go from the 1.75 up to 3%. But I want to regulate the insurance industry enough to make it so that it's fair. The MCCA, the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Account, is the thing that's driving our insurance industry way up here in Michigan. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I think it should be optional for the majority of people. I don't think it should be mandatory for everybody. Matter of fact, my insurance went up $140 a month because of the MCCA, which is your PIP. So now I'm going to challenge you a little bit on there and and, and, and the, the some of the reason behind, let's say again, with the ACA and putting the premiums in place to force you to purchase health insurance was because if people had health insurance that they had to pay for, chances are they would use it. It's been demonstrated that in other countries, the more you use your preventative health care, the healthy you are. So the same kind of goes with auto insurance. If we kind of looked at the same thing, if you didn't have the auto insurance, how how are you going to how are people going to desire to continue to do that? Because again, if they have the audio insurance, they have it just in case something else happens. Think about it in my case, if I chose not to to have that and I hit a pole or I hit another car and I'm found at fault, they're gonna bleed me dry. I'll never be able to pay for anything. Like they could sue me for all of my money's worth. Are you gonna put other preventative measures in there so people cannot be sued and that their individual insurance companies have to pick up, or how, how would that work? Well, to, to give you an idea, I have two actual in auto insurance agencies or owners of the agencies who are behind me on the MCCA. Okay. The biggest thing that bothers me about that account, it is, doesn't bother me that it's over $20 billion now. What bothers me is that's only Michigander's money in there problem where the real anger comes from a lot of people that I've spoken to is not one dime of that is invested in our state. You know, it's invested in California, it's invested in Florida, it's invested in Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. Why isn't that money being invested in Michigan instead of outside the state? That's our money. Uh, out of the twenty billion dollars last year, a little over six hundred million was utilized for catastrophic claims. Okay, that tells me that they're taking too much money from us. If that account is that large and we're not utilizing, now I'm not saying that we need to balance it out so that it's only being uh, used for the claims that are there, because you never know when these claims are going to come in. Okay, but. For it to have grown, uh, what, nearly 10 times more than what it is, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have anything in front of me to show that, but at six, I think it's 675 million was utilized last year. Out of 19, at that time, there was a little over 19 billion in there. You know, that tells me they're taking too much money. So how would, and, you re, how would you restrict them from taking as much money? Well, we would we would uh, make it so that it was an optional thing for the people to purchase. Most people will still purchase something that's optional. And not all of them are, but we need to get the insurance company down. You've got insurance companies outside the state that will not come into the state because of, of how high the insurance rates have to be for them to get into the pool. And we need to make it fair. So, I mean, you see on cable TV all the time. I'm sure you've seen these commercials for the general auto insurance. Oh, yeah. Try to get, <laughs> and they'll say they don't even come into Michigan. You, you know, you can get auto insurance in Ohio for $39 a month. 
the cheapest you're going to get here in Michigan is roughly right around a hundred bucks. And that's, again, it's going up because the PIP is going up. I have Liberty Mutual. And like I said, it just went up $140. When I called them, she says it's because of your PIP. You know, this is mm -hmm. stuff that I'm trying to get under control because the insurance industry is out of control and nobody is trying to uh, put a stop to it. Now, there was a bill that was introduced. Since I've started running for office, I've gained some friends <laughs> on both sides of the aisle already. Uh, a republic, couple of Republicans and a couple of Democrats. I've had both of them tell me that there's a bill that was just put into Lansing in October to try to lower health or excuse me, lower auto insurance. But here's what they've told me also. They plan to delay it till after Thanksgiving, which they did. They'll come back in and push it to the after the end of the year. And when they come back in in, in January, they're going to kill it. Hmm. Because if you look at it and you can follow the money, the auto insurance or industry just put nearly $10 million in both of their party coffers. They're hedging their bets. They're buying and paying for our politicians. And I think that happens well, quite a bit, to be honest with you. <laughs> what's that? I said, I believe that that happens quite a bit. That will not happen in my administration. I, I want the people to hold me accountable. I want the people to... When I make a, when I, I'm a man of my word is what I like to think. When I tell you I'm going to do something, I do it. I find a way to make things work. And every one of those campaign promises that are out on the back of my cards that I'm passing out that are on my website, nine of those I will have in effect by the first year, end of my first year. The 500,000 jobs I plan to bring to Michigan is spread out over the four years. But with the infrastructure re, uh, rebuilding that I have planned, the legalization of marijuana all across the board, uh, for infrastructure repair, we estimate between 150 to 200,000 new jobs, good paying jobs. The legalization of marijuana, I want to keep strictly Michigan residents only. I don't want outside manufacturers coming in and open these dispensaries. I mean, this bill that was just passed, uh, most of our dispensaries were shut down. Oh, I know. <laughs> and now they're talking that in order to open a dispensary, you have to have $300,000 cash, liquid assets, in order to function. What that tells me, that's trying to get big business in here and not allowing Michigan residents to make a living off of it. Yeah, and that was now, actually some of the complaints I had with some of the bills that were on the ballot last year is because there was people trying to put, you know, all these different bills on the ballot and they were favoring, you know, limiting individuals from being able to grow their own. They were limiting people from how much they could have at their house. They were forcing you to go to certain chains. They were going to limit the amount of licenses sell, sold. And they were going, they, essentially what it felt like to me is they were saying, hey, if you're white and have a lot of money, Here's a good opportunity to continue to make money. But what they're doing is they're walking over a lot of the other residents who've been caught up, you know, in the drug wars, um, who've had all sorts of different issues and now gives them the opportunity to, you know, here's a business that anybody can invest in. If you know how to grow weed, you know, you can make money. And and you're right, if they're gonna create a three hundred thousand dollar liquid asset, you know, cash assets, that's just ridiculous. I mean, I don't I don't have that. Oh, and what about the $20 million that Canada is investing in up north for the, I believe they're OBDs or CBDs, which are, I may be saying them wrong. I'm not well versed in marijuana laws and, and products, okay? But those are the pills that have the medicinal effect, but not the high is what yes. I'm being told. Essentially, that's what that is. Yeah, they're extracting um, a certain portion of the plant and they're growing certain plants that are heavier in that. Because like the CBD pills um, show a high, again, it's not, this is, this is not me endorsing fake science because this has technically not legally been tested yet, but they do show good rates for seizure patients um, a lot, actually, and cancer patients and stuff like that as well. Well, you know, this is what I don't want. I don't want big pharma coming in here and taking over the legalization, the medicinal and all that. 
I want the people, I want it kept strictly Michigan. I don't want Colorado coming in here and opening up dispensaries in our state. You know, and I can, I can show you, I can tell you the stats. You know, some people said if we fully legalize, the crime rate's going to go up. Well, it's proven already with the, I mean, Colorado for its first year, the crime rate went down 12%. Yep. You know, <laughs> uh, then like I ran into with Paul Mitchell's uh, number one guy there, Dan Brown, when I was at a, a tea party uh, meet and greet, he tried to call me an idiot because uh, that I was talking fake news because of with opioid addiction, heroin addiction, and methamphetamine addiction in, in Colorado alone, those three addictions dropped between eight and 12% because they had a legal way of going around it now so that they weren't getting in trouble. You know, the crime rate's proven its drop. It brought that state, its first year brought them over $150 million for taxes. Wall Street has already said that if Michigan legalizes within two years of $7.2 billion, that translates to Michigan with nearly a billion dollars in taxes that I want to put into our schools. You know, my budget for the schools is $20 billion because I want to make pre-K all the way up to K tw uh, to 12, but I want to add two years of community college on top of that. I want to bring two years of community college into our public school system. I'm a strong advocate for the public schools. I'm not an advocate for charter schools and the private schools. I do not believe our taxpayer dollars should be going to schools for profit. Well, good. <laughs> and that's basically, that's basically what a charter school is, a public school for profit. Yes. And yeah. our tax dollars should be going. When I went to school, Michigan was ranked in the top 15. Now we're at, I believe we're at number 49 or 50 out of the states. And that's, that's terrible. I mean, uh, when uh, Schneider was running his last term, you had, I believe it was Gary Showers, and you had Gary Showers saying, uh, Rick Schneider took a billion dollars out of our schools. And then you got Rick Schneider saying he, he put a billion dollars in our schools. The sad part is that was the truth for both of them. Rick Schneider pulled a billion dollars out of our classrooms and put it into the retirement funds for the administrations. That's wrong. You never take kid money from our kids. My plan is to put it in with our teachers and our classrooms. Yeah, I and, mean, our and that's deserve ten to fifteen percent raise. I mean, our schools aren't be fu being funded properly. And I can give you the perfect example. I live in Lake Orion, Michigan. Great school district. On count day or head count day, whatever you want to call it, we get over ten thousand dollars per student. You go down to inner city Detroit, they get fifty four to fifty eight hundred per child, and you wonder why the school system down there is failing. You know, yes. you can go up to you can go up to Boyne City, they're getting seventy eight hundred per student, and they're doing great up there. So I want to make fair to any school system they will be getting the same amount of money not so, go ahead i was gonna say so so well two questions and a how will you do that <laughs> because I, I i agree 100 percent with that and b are you going to be able to utilize some of the tax dollars from let's say the legalization which which it really should pass this year for christ's sake you know but are you going to be able to utilize more of that money to help some of those inner city schools? Like you said, Detroit, Grand Rapids is kind of the same thing. We both those schools are, are very are struggling compared to other communities. If we can get our politicians hands out of these funds, we can get our schools up running properly. OK, yeah, you're right. I have actually set 60 percent of the money from the legalization of marijuana to go into our public school system. And a lot of this is all done by, like I've said before, the restructuring of our tax system. You know, uh, the only time I can tell you I give accolades to Rick Schneider is he raised the budget for the schools from 13.4 billion to 15.2 billion, but it took him six years to do it. And that's wrong. You know, then you hear about the states closing 26 schools. 
Well, first off, the state cannot close our schools. It has to be the communities that close the schools. But they're forcing the communities to close the schools because they're cutting money to the schools. You don't hear about all that, but that's exactly what they're doing. Now, I have a hard time. I've been out reaching out to the school unions and to the teachers. The unions, they don't want to talk to me. They vote Democrat no matter what. But every time I talk to a teacher, they like what I stand for because I stand for them in the classroom and the kids. You know, I have seven kids. Uh, the last of mine are in college at CMU up in Mount Pleasant right now. But the whole fact is we need to make change. And the only way we're going to get change is not voting for a Democrat or a Republican. Gretchen so Whitmer's leading Democrat right now. Uh, Shree Thander's coming up on her pretty good. but. She's not going to she's going to follow the party line, no matter what we believe and what she says. And the only thing she's doing right now is she's pointing out all our problems. She's not giving us solutions to fix these problems. I mean, you know, look at our state lottery system. That's supposed to be helping our schools. You ask them and they'll tell you every dime that they get goes to it. All right. Uh, for, uh, 40 to 60 percent of it goes to the winner. Understandable. Why does 30% go to administration? How hard is it for uh, a man or a woman to walk up to say, here's your check? I don't, and I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> the whole thing is we don't have that many state lottery offices around Michigan. We don't need that many. I'll tell you what, you win $5,000, you're going to drive from Zealand to Lansing to pick it up? Uh, yeah. Okay. So why do we need... Uh, a bunch of uh, state lottery offices all over Michigan. You probably don't. Yeah, just making a simple case of it is all I'm doing at this point. But the fact, you know, if you look at the the state budget page, you look on there the state lottery. It only puts 5.5 percent into our schools. That's atrocious. Yes, and, and you know that's what the funny thing was when. Uh, oh, who is the? Uh... Who is the who was before Schneider? Uh, that was when I was still in high school. I can't remember what her name is. Jennifer Granholm. There you go, Jennifer Granholm. That was one of the big things that she ran on is, hey, I'm going to put more money in the schools through the lottery. I'm going to raise sin tax on alcohol and cigarettes. And then you know what she did? She stripped other things out of the school. So like we got that money. She fulfilled her promise, but then she took extra money out of the budget, which essentially netted us no extra income. And then now we're relying so you know we're relying on you know lottery funds, um, and, and that was something that you know. And again, I, I I'm young. I was younger <laughs> back then, but that was something that was a distaste in my mouth. And I voted Democrat many many times, and and that's a distaste for me. Is so you're you're not planning when you get into office to say, hey, we're going to substitute some of these these legalization tax dollars and take strip something else out of the schools, are you? No, no. I, I, like I said, the budget I want for our schools is at $20 billion. Okay, let me, you know, how much, our budget for this year, if I remember right, was $56.2 billion. Do you realize that all our taxes combined in Michigan last year was $131.7 billion? But yet the budget to operate on was 56.2. Well, where's the rest where's of the money? Where nearly $80 billion go? Michigan has paid off its deficit every year. Okay. that They roughly count on borrowing loans and uh, bonds and every of nearly $80 billion every year to do certain things. Well, let me give you a good example why I get so up. I'm getting wound up. I apologize for this, Chris. <laughs> but hey, you might as well, right? Yes. I'm in the transportation business, have been all my life, okay? The gas tax in Michigan, which just went up last January, 7.3 cents, okay? After Michigan voted in May of 2015 to turn down Prop 1 because they wanted to raise our sales tax one cent. But behind that was 10 other laws, and part of it was to raise uh, our gas tax then. But the money that they said for that one cent uh, sales tax increase was supposed to help our schools and our roads. OK, the roads wouldn't have seen it for two years. Here's the thing that bothers me. Even before they raised that seven point three cents, 
they're making $57 million a week on the gas tax alone. That's not counting the diesel tax. That's the gas tax. That's $2.96 billion a year on just gas. You add the diesel tax in, that's another $3 billion. So you're talking $6 billion. Okay. Out of that money, they're only utilizing 26.28% of that money for our roads, for our bridges and roads. That was created in the early 70s just for our roads and bridges. All the other states are utilizing between 70 and 80% of their gas tax money. We're only using a little over 26%. Then you wonder why our roads are in such bad shape. You know, if they would get their fingers out of these slush funds as they're utilizing them for, our state wouldn't have to have as high a tax. Do you realize Michigan's number six on the highest taxes? Uh, we, sure are number we, are. Three. we are number three now on the gas tax alone. California and New York are the ones that beat us. And now I, I do have a question since we've kind of moved into the gas tax. On your website, you said that we pay 58.84 cents per gallon for fuel, yet only 14.71 cents of this tax goes to the roads. So I guess I, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, I, I'm kind of questioning where that number comes from because the DOT has – you know they have published rates. There was a couple of other articles I found. So how do you how do you get that fifty six percent or fifty six cents tax um, that 18, we're paying on fuel? Eighteen point four cents of that is the federal tax dollar. Okay, Michigan. They like to tell everybody it's they have a, a nineteen cent gas tax. Okay, if you go to uh, American Petroleum Institute. You can pull up every state's gas tax. It has the breakdown for the actual uh, excise tax and all the other taxes that are included into it. Um, sometimes you got to dig in there to find it, but it's there. That's where I got all my information. Uh, there's 19 cents per gallon, uh, like I said, excise tax. Then you have six, is it 16 or 15? Now, these are old numbers from the year before. They're gone up since he raised it 7.3 cents. Uh, you got like 15.99 cents also on there that states other state taxes and fees. Okay, they don't like to tell you about that. So they like, they've told us all this time that we were only paying 19 cents a gallon on state tax. But like I said, there's 15.99 cents in there set. Uh, for other state taxes and fees. And when I confronted uh, the Republican gentleman up in Port Huron, maybe I shouldn't even even said where. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, call him out all you want, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he actually told me he didn't know how much we pay. And when I brought, I handed him the piece of paper and he says, I didn't know we were paying that much. And I said, but yet you voted to raise the gas tax. When I and I've also brought up to some of these uh, state reps, you know, I have to gather thirty thousand signatures. No, you don't. You only got to gather fifteen thousand. I said, yeah, if I'm a rep, if I'm a Republican or a Democrat, but as an independent, I have to gather thirty thousand. Oh, I didn't know that. You know, in order to represent the people in your district, you need to know what the hell is going on in your state. So that's crazy. Okay, so I got to stop you. Say you're that's crazy. So you are right. I just googled it, and we pay a state exercise tax of twenty six point three, other right. state taxes and fees at fifteen point eight four. So the twenty six point three is the published one that they claim this year it's going to go up to. We also right. pay something called an other state tax and fee for fifteen point eight four. So the total state tax and fees are at forty two point one four. Now, if you add the federal tax in there, we do hit sixty point five four. And mine are, at that point, you that, you're that you're low compared to that. <laughs> well, that's because I have last year's numbers. I didn't add the seven point three yet. There you go. But that's okay. So now I got to go into this and figure out why that is. That's that's weird that nobody else really knows that. Like how how is this not a bigger thing, especially for? Republicans who run on the idea of low taxes, how is this not a, this should be a huge platform well, thing. They are lying and misleading us 
as like we're sheeple. I hate to use that word. Okay. The, the two party system is not being honest with the people. This is why I said I will hold them accountable. And I'll tell you what, on December 18th, I'll be in front of the Franklin Murphy Hall of Justice. I've actually written a bill. And, and I will, and when I'm elected, I'll bring it into law under audacious, audacious law. It will hold all elected officials accountable by us, the people. It will literally give us, the people, the ability to remove a, an official, elected official from office, including a judge. Because of something we have not had in the state of Michigan in over 150 years. Yeah, people, and it's called the common law grand jury or the people's grand jury. We have a grand jury, but the, they've been stripped of their authority. You remember Antonin Scalia, the past late justice? Uh -huh. Yeah, a little in too much. In 2005, he wrote his opinion on the people's grand jury. It's a fourth branch of government belonging to the people, not to be held by, not to be, be held by the other three branches, basically. That is in my bill and the law that I am writing. And uh, it, this will be announced on December 18th in front of the Frank Murphy Hall of Justice in Detroit. This also gives the people the ability, and I hate to bring this up, we've had a number of police shootings with unarmed people, black and white, that are getting acquitted when they should be indicted. So, yeah, yeah I, if you could fix that, that, uh, that would be a miracle. I mean, that's police corruption is it's well, it's huge. It's disgusting. Um, look, like I said, I'm going to eliminate the corruption in Lansing and our courts. And I'm, this is the way to do it. This gives people, you and I, the power to do it. And it's and it's protected by the Supreme Court. If it's brought into effect, the Supreme Court will stand behind it. The bill I have written or in the middle of writing is backed by uh, Supreme Court cases. It's backed by Antonin Scalia, the late justice and Justice Powell. Their own opinions are in this bill. Along with the court cases that backs it up. See, and that's good. Those are those are some of the things, you know, that I can get behind because that for me, that's a bit that's always kind of been a big thing. You know, I mean, a lot of people are like, well, hey, these things don't happen. You know, the, these things really this is an anomaly. But, you know, I have friends who, you know, and I am inside of different communities where people have been lost to police shootings all over the board. This is and it's insane that anybody <clears throat> thinks this doesn't exist any longer. I don't know. Maybe that's and, just me. And look at it this way. What do you think is going to happen if, if I get elected, which I will? I pass this law here in Michigan, put it into effect. What do you think the other states are going to do? They're going to look at it. Because, you know, some people say, well, we have the recall. That's how we can uh, hold our uh, politicians accountable. That is not true. Because look, and we'll use old Rick Schneider as an example. <laughs> when they put him up for recall, when they were getting close to the number of signatures they needed, they changed the law because we started gearing up for an early election. And then it was sweep, swept right out from under our feet. They changed the law. So you tell me the recall is fair. Oh, we, we know it's not. We know so, it's not. That's part of the reason why I started thinking and learning the laws and came up with this bill. The other part of it is for the police shootings. Look at our officers that are getting caught in these police shootings. They're still getting paid while they're on in, under investigation. Why? We go out there. If we do it, we're going right to jail. We ain't getting a paycheck no more because we're in jail. <laughs> Why are they any different than us? And yeah. I actually, some law enforcement that is behind me on this bill. So. Well, and that, okay. I, I think that's, <laughs> that, that's very good. 
And, you know, I think those are, you know, it's kind of, you know, if, if I had to give one opinion about your website, if you posted that type of thing on there, I actually, those are big things. I know you put on here, you're, you know, you're against the, uh, and you're going to change the corruption and things like that. I think that's a big sell, especially for Michigan. I think that for you as an individual, that's something both parties can buy into. That's something that we can all get behind to say, hey, how can you stay out, stop racial discrimination? How can you stop police shootings from happening all over the place? Um, Once we announce the bill, we will post it on the website. Awesome. Well, Todd, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us tonight. It's not uh, every day that we get to talk to a future Michigan governor. <laughs> um, but what I want to do as, as we wrap the, the segment up, I want you to do two things for us. One, I want you to tell people how they can help support you. And B, where's the best place they can find you if they have any questions about your campaign or anything you stand for? Okay. Uh, first off, you can go to my website, which is www.schleigerforgovernor2018.com. Uh, you, you can find me on Facebook at Todd Schleiger. It's my personal page that comes up and my campaign page. And believe me, I do answer the questions that people you put post on there for me. Uh, the website, if you go to the contact page, it goes directly to me. Uh, I'm not much of a Twitter person, but I do have a Twitter account. I, I don't know how to use it. I'll be honest with you. Uh, but my Facebook and the website are the best ways to get a hold of me. And I'll even go one step farther. If you go on my Facebook page, my phone number is public knowledge right there. And I do answer the phone. So, and if I don't, it's because I work 19 hours a day. If I'm not at the job that I work at, I actually drive Lyft. I go out and I, I'm all over Michigan driving Lyft. Sometimes I'll go even go. I was even in Grand Rapids a couple weeks ago driving Lyft. So, you know, I'm I'm getting out there and I'm talking to the people. I will respond to your messages. I will respond to your phone calls. You know, just reach out to me. And if you want to volunteer, you can go on the web page. Uh, there's Chris Rusin. Uh, his email address is on the bottom of the home page. It's also on the contact page. If you want to volunteer, we'll gladly help take your help. We have a donation button on there. You can donate any amount of money you want. We have buttons that are three, five, ten, and other. Uh, whatever you can do to help out, we need to make this work for the people of Michigan because you you're not going to get another chance. So. Well, awesome. Thank you again, Todd, for joining us tonight. And again, all your links will be right into the description of the show. Thank you again so much for joining us, and have a good night, sir. You too, Chris. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker. CellarDoorSkeptics.com